how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. As I do many times as I minister the word and the more that I do, the more you behold the law of the Lord, the more beautiful it is, you know. I want to offer again thanks unto the Lord that he who uh, labors must be first partaker of the fruits. That is, you can't give anything to anybody else unless you eat of it first. And so I feel as Nehemiah, I believe it was, that I've uh, tasted that the Lord is good, and only because of this I can show it unto you. And so I, I thank the Lord and, and offer praise unto his name that he, that he allows us to partake of the divine nature. The Holy Spirit and the new birth is, uh, very, intrigued me very much when I received the, uh, le the letter from Mike. And uh, I want to start out by saying that the, the new birth by the Spirit is, is uh, it, it's for all, all, all of God's people. This is not a, something that we attain unto. Now I'm born of the Spirit. But he said that he would pour forth his, his Spirit on all flesh. And so this is something that, that we all have. Now the, the new birth of the Spirit is the start of the, of the eternal purpose of God. That he's purposed within himself and in Christ Jesus. The, whole, the, the being born again is the start of this eternal purpose. Ephesians 1 verse 10 says he's at the dispensation of the fullness of times. He's going to gather in one all things in Christ. Those which are in heaven and on earth. All things together in him. All things are going to come together in Christ. And Colossians 1 verse 20 says he's going to reconcile all things to himself, both things which are in earth and things which are in heaven, through Christ unto himself. This is, this, is the, this is the end that God's heading towards, that all things are going to come together. That is to say, the blasphemers will no longer blaspheme. The boasters will no longer boast. The liars will no longer lie, and the murderers will no longer murder. All things are going to be reconciled. Now, some people will be reconciled by force. They won't want to bow, but they will. And they won't want to confess, but they will. All things are going to be reconciled unto God. All things are going to be brought together in unity. Everything will be harmonious, and nothing will be contrary in Christ. That's, that's the, the goal that God's headed towards. And this new birth by the, by the Spirit is like the first installment heading towards this eternal purpose of God. Ephesians chapter 3 says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. This is where God's heading. He's going to display himself in the church. And then Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10, that it might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So God's taking his own person, his glory, the, the praise of the glory of His grace, the scripture says. We're going to show forth the praise of the glory of His grace and the manifold wisdom of God. Now, God can display His power in Pharaoh. God can display power. He can make a donkey talk with a man's voice. That takes power. And he can make the, the tree wither from the roots up. That takes power. But He's, manifolding, he's making manifest His wisdom in the church. Not his power. He's making manifest his wisdom. So having the glory of God, the new Jerusalem will, will without flaw represent and portray the wisdom of our almighty God. This, so this is where God's heading with the church. He's going to make us, as it were, a living showcase. Living stones built up into habitation of God through the Spirit. And I think this being very close to the heart of, of our Father is that he's redeeming from the world of the sons of men a wife for his son yes. revelation 19 7 the marriage of the lamb has come and the wife has made herself ready yes. see the church will be ready <laughs> when the day comes he, they will be ready and so this is this is where where we're heading coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and so the, the new birth, again, is, the, is the, like the first installment heading towards this eternal purpose of God. And we can, we can see the end of it. See, God, God showed us the last chapter. <laughs> we can see the end of it, but the new birth is our, is our first engagement into this grand eternal purpose of God. 
And no one will be able to thwart this purpose. See, God says it will come to pass. And there's no, nobody's going to be able to stop it. No one will. Now, God, this is what God's always wanted to do. Is put his spirit in his people. This is always what he wanted to do. In the Old Testament, several times it said that the spirit came upon them. And, but it also in the Old Testament said that the spirit at that time left him. But this is not the way in the New Covenant. New Covenant, he wanted to put his spirit within the people. That they might walk in the Spirit. And he, he dwells in, the, in his people through the Spirit. This is what he wanted to do. He revealed this in the prophets. Joel chapter 2. This is the text that Peter uh, preached the day of Pentecost. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. See, it didn't used to be poured out on all flesh. David had it. Moses had it. Abraham. See, there's just a few here and there. But now, in the New Covenant, Christ has, has uh, made the people, made us... Uh, to able to, to bear the Spirit. And so now God can give, give forth His Spirit unto all flesh, young men, old men, servants, and handmaids. There's no distinction now. He's able to give the, give the Spirit on, on a broad scope. This is what He wanted to do. Psalms chapter 104 says that, Thou sendest forth Thy Spirit, and Thou renewest the face of the earth. This is what the Lord wanted to do. Where the Spirit goes, there is life. See, the Spirit hovered over the face of the earth in, in, the, in the Genesis. And then we read of life springing up. So this is like the first picture that the Lord has given. When the Spirit comes, that's what brings life. When the Spirit is not there, you will not find life, period. Amen. The Spirit, it is the Spirit that gives life. And so the Spirit reverse the, reverses the effects of sin. And bringing life. Now, Ezekiel chapter 36, the Lord said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways. And you will keep my statutes and my judgments and do them. See, this is was the heart of the Lord. He's opening up his desires. This is what the Lord always wanted to do. This is what he wanted. This was the Lord's heart. He didn't want people to offer sacrifices only because he said so. See, you could keep the law and, and hate the law. You could, keep the, you could do what the Lord commanded you to do in the law and not want to. But this, is not, this was not pleasing to the Lord. He wanted to give, give his spirit and cause them to walk in his statutes. And now, now the Lord can guide his people with his eye. He doesn't treat his people as the horse and the mule that's, that has the, brit and the, the bit and the bridle. He can guide them with his eye. At the base of Mount Sinai, after the Lord had given all the commandments... The people said, uh, said, we will do it. We will do it all. And the Lord lamented to Moses and says, oh, that the people had a heart to do it. See, the Spirit will give you the heart to do what the Lord wants you to do. And this makes all the difference in the world. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, the angel showed the prophet a, a uh, heavenly vision, which we, is, was amazingly similar to the vision that John saw in Revelation of the seven golden lampstands. I, I believe it's a a uh, prophetic picture of the church and her source of life is what, Jer of what Zechariah saw there in chapter, chapter 4. And uh, the angel said, he says, Not by power, Zechariah, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Yes. See, so the, the Lord was opening up his heart. This is the way the Lord always wanted to do it. He wanted to give of his spirit. This is what he wanted to do. So having seen that heavenly vision... Um, Zechariah heard of good things to come. Amen. Now, I guess my main text would be from uh, John chapter 3 of uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, John says. And the same came unto him by night. And I, I've heard people kind of badmouth Zechariah that maybe he was, or not Zechariah, Nicodemus for coming to him by night for perhaps being scared. But I think maybe Nicodemus wanted to have some private time to really ask some things of the Lord. So I, I don't think that of, of Nicodemus. And uh, Jesus kind of interrupted <laughs> Nicodemus in his presenting his case to the Lord, kind of interrupted him. And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Impossibility. Without new life, it can be in your midst, and the people will not know it. 
unless they be born again. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. Marvel not at this, that ye must be born again, because the Lord has offered, has given ample proof that you must be born again. He's given ample grounds for this to be a reasonable conclusion that the sons of men must be born again. He set this forth in, in the scriptures. There, is, there was no recovery course, see, from sin. There was no discipline procedure to recover from sin. And the Lord, the Lord like hammered the nails in the coffin of the flesh. Amen. He did not leave it open. You must be born again. This was the only option. Why must we be born again, Jesus? Let's answer this question. Because there is none righteous, no, not one. They have all together turned aside. They have all together become useless. Ye must be born again. The divine effect upon mankind is this, that the scripture or the divine edict, I'm sorry, has, upon mankind, the scripture has concluded all under sin. Jews, Greeks, slave, free, male, female, they're all under sin. You must be born again. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, you must be born again. Isaiah said, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And his hid his face from you so that he does not hear. What, how do we resolve this? The Lord's hid his face. <laughs> well, anyone that has an inkling of tenderness will say, I can do nothing of this situation. You must be born again because your sins have separated you between you and your God. I think the, the foundational reason for this mandated new birth is that we were dead. You must have life by being born as life. You must be born again because you were, you were dead. Uh, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. So death passed upon all men. Why? For all have sinned. Anybody that has sinned, death has come on to you. You were dead in trespasses and sins. See, sin is not a cosmetic problem. Sin does not just make the outside of the cup dirty. Sin has gone to the heart and core of man. So that... Even though the Lord says, even though I told you of what I would do, you would not believe it. That's being dead in trespasses and sins. He must be born again. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, the Spirit deals with this inward problem of sin. So because of, the, because of what sin has done, sin has defiled us inwardly. This, David said in the Psalms, that desire is truth in the inward parts. That's what the Lord wanted. Sin had gone to the very core of, of man, so salvation has to go farther than that. It has to go farther than that. And this is what, see, the new birth does not restore us to where Adam was. The new birth does not restore the Garden of Eden. It's gone beyond that. That we might be filled to all the fullness of God. Adam did not have this. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, And ye, and you... Hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Verse 2, among them also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. The sin is not a... Sin makes people lean towards the world. Sin makes people bent towards carnality and unrighteousness and iniquity. You ever seen small brooks through, the, through, through a land and any foliage or trees, they, they grow bent towards the water because that's where the life, the water brings the life to the foliage. They grow... You've seen these trees growing like this instead of straight up. Sin makes people go like this towards the world. They make people bent towards the world. Children of disobedience. It was ingrained in our nature. The first 
time a child is given the opportunity to lie, they do it. The first time they have the ability, the opportunity to do something behind the parent's back, they do it. Believe me, I did it. Children of disobedience, children of wrath. That is, that, that's really what was coming to us. That re wrath really, outside of Christ, wrath was just for the children of men. Children of wrath. This was, this was our, this was our only, only possibility outside of Christ. Children of disobedience and children of wrath. Romans 8, 7 says, The carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject unto the law of God, neither indeed can be. This children, these children of wrath, the children of disobedience, the scripture calls it the old man, that which is of the earth, the earthy. See, there's a part in us, brethren, that cannot be, be recovered. The old man cannot be recovered. It cannot be revamped cannot be reconditioned, cannot be restored. It can't be. The carnal mind is enmity towards God, cannot subject itself to the law of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither indeed can he know them. It's an impossibility. Flesh and spirit are incompatible. They do not go together. You cannot serve God and mammon. See, it goes with all the rest of what God has said. What, what uh, fellowship has light with darkness? They do not go together. Flesh and spirit, they are, the flesh is non-recoverable. Uh, the spirit asked the Galatians, Are ye now made perfect in the flesh? No. You cannot be made perfect in the flesh. Well, I believe... That we have, we have a lot of people, contemporaries in, in the world today, that are striving to be made perfect in the flesh. Uh, people need to, be, need to hear this, that the carnal mind is not, cannot be subject unto the law of God. It cannot be, so don't try. Don't try to make your flesh want to go to heaven. It won't. You must be born again. See, it cannot, cannot happen. This message will liberate people from a weight. It'll liberate people from, from vain strivings. You strive in the flesh for the ple to please the Lord, and you never will. You never will please the Lord in the flesh. Them that are in the flesh cannot please God. Amen. Can't do it. You, we need to tell people this. We need to tell people that you can be born again. Yes. Amen. Having to do something and wanting to do something is a, there's a big difference between the two. Amen. We cannot recover cover the flesh. Isaiah chapter 35, he saw a highway of righteousness. And it was a highway of righteousness. And he says, the fool shall not err therein. I'm glad he said that. <laughs> the fool shall not err therein. But he said also, the unclean shall not pass over it shall not pass over it. Ye must be born again. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 20 says, Put off the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. It is corrupt and it always will be. It always will be. That's why you put it, put it off. That which is of Adam will always be of Adam. That which is of the flesh is flesh. See, in the world, it, it's a glorious thing to take an old house, an old house, and to, to recondition it, to rebuild it. And people glory in it. It's worth more, than, a house 100 years old, been restored, is worth more than it was when it was built. See, the, the, the world bows down to this. Take an old car, and you, they, we have old, old car shows. The older it is, the better it looks. That's the better it is. It's worth more that way if it's, if it's old and been fixed up. See, this is, this is of the world. God does not do this. That which, that which is old is ready to disappear. Amen. It's ready to disappear in God's kingdom. And so, so is the flesh. He does not, he does not uh, revamp the flesh, as it were. Now, you must be born again also because our condition outside of Christ automatically excluded us from the blessing of God. Automatically. Just being born into the world 
If, you, if you're in the body, you're automatically, by nature, excluded from the presence of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. God's pledged himself to this. Unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Impossibility. Revelation 21, 27, There shall in no wise enter into it, now John's just saw the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles. Neither that so which worketh abominations. Nothing. It shall not enter in. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. See, you have to be more than just human. People say, well, I'm, I'm just human. I'm just a man. You have to be more than that. You have to be born again. If you're just flesh and blood... You shall not enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. You must be born again. If we are to have any hope, we must be born again. Now, the, the Lord gave the law, as it were, nails in the coffin of the flesh. Man outside of Christ would not come to these conclusions. On, on our own, if we were just given, given bare, minimal information... We would not come to the conclusion, well, Lord, we must be born again. Man would not come to this conclusion on, on their own. So God gave the law. God gave the law to, to pinpoint out this problem. Paul said the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Apart from that commandment, thou shalt not covet, Paul said he was blameless. He was, blame he was alive apart from the law, he says. But when that one commandment came, sin revived. Sin revived with a commandment of the law. Because deep down in Paul, from Adam, there was a desire for what the law said not to do. So when the commandment came, it swept up the sin. Sin revived, and I died. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It was a hard schoolmaster a hard schoolmaster bringing you under Christ. There was no third chance with the law. But it is an effectual schoolmaster. It's a good, the law is a good teacher, is it not? Amen. To bring us unto Christ. Revel, or Romans 8 verse 3 says that what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. See, the law itself was not weak. The law was good and holy and perfect. And it was spiritual. But it was weak through the flesh. Amen. That is, you put, you put this good, holy, and spiritual law in, in carnal vessels, jars of clay, the scripture says, then the commandment becomes weak because of what's holding it. It was weak through the flesh. And so thus pointing out, you have to have more than flesh. The law, in, in a hard way, says ye must be born again. In fact, the strength of sin is the law. That's the strength of sin. So it doesn't, doesn't make sense to preach law unto people. <laughs> You're trying to, the, the church is mission, any, I, I do believe that the, broadly the, the ministers of the gospel in, in, the, in our country here, they have, they have a good heart. Some of them not, towards, not according to knowledge as Paul, but I think the majority of them at least want to see the people liberated from bondage. Well, you don't preach people, you don't preach law unto people that are bound because the strength of sin is the law you must be born again and Jesus did say don't marvel at this there's, am there's ample revelation and information that the Lord has given that you must be born again Amen. it is the spirit who gives life you must be born again and so the Lord gave us of his spirit and it is the spirit that gives life. The Spirit said to, to the Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, so that's being, being born of the Spirit, having begun of the Spirit, in the Spirit, anyone that has begun, they began in the Spirit. And anyone that ends, they're going to end in the Spirit. Amen. You will not start outside of the Spirit. You will not, and you will not end outside of the Spirit. Amen. It is the Spirit who gives life. At Pentecost, the Spirit had come down upon the, in forms of cloven uh, 
flames upon the, the apostles, and they spoke with other tongues the mighty works of God. <clears throat> and they said, these men are full of sweet wine, is what they said. But after he, Peter preached this sermon from Joel, chapter 2, he says they were pricked in their hearts, and the, more than likely, some of the very ones that cast their vote against him, crucify him, crucify him, let his blood be upon us and on our children, some of the same ones, at least of the same people, said, what must we do to be saved? What was the difference? What was the difference in these two occasions? The Spirit had given life. That was the difference. They had begun in the Spirit. The Ethiopian eunuch, he was from Africa. He was, he was not of the children of promise. He was not of the heirs. He was not of the, the, this olive tree that was cultivated in the, in the law and in the prophets. He was a foreigner. But he said, here's water. Here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And so Philip, Philip baptized him, and he went on his way rejoicing. After Philip was caught away, you know that that eunuch got something. He went on his way rejoicing, not having his, his, the, fir the first preacher of the gospel with him. He disappeared, and uh, he went on his way rejoicing. He had begun in the Spirit. He was being, being born of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul, the chief of sinners, the Scripture says, the Apostle Paul was, and he, he, he venomously, he said he destroyed the church, ravaged the church. Went to great extents, great efforts to, to hurt, hurt the people of God. And in uh, Acts chapter 9, it says, There fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he arose and was baptized. And not too long after that, just a few weeks, the scripture seems to indicate, that he was in the synagogue, <laughs> then back into the synagogue, preaching that, Christ, that this was the Christ. Jesus, that this was the Christ. Now, the, I, I wouldn't think for a minute that his contemporaries wouldn't raise an eyebrow to having seen, to seeing this change in, the, in, in Saul of Tarsus at that time. This would, this would have caused great confusion among this Hebrew of Hebrews for this to happen. But Paul had begun in the Spirit. The Spirit had given life. See, Paul was, he was submerged in the law. He was submerged, he, he was even of the tribe of Benjamin and circumcised of the eighth day. So as far as externals, he was right in the center, right in the middle of what God had said and what God had commanded and what God was doing. He was right in the middle of it. But then he vehemently opposed the very thing God was doing in Christ. He opposed it. So that, that, that tells you what the flesh, what, what you can, what the flesh will do. But he, he began, began in the Spirit. Now Jesus says that he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And he's the author and the finisher. So that in the kingdom, everything starts with Christ. Everything ends with Christ. Everything God's doing, he did it in Christ. Everything he finishes, which is everything he started, he's going to end in Christ. And then at the end, he's going to hand it all back to God, that God might be all in all. And even the Son is going to be subject unto him, that put all things under him. So Jesus set the stage for salvation. The scripture says in Matthew 1 verse 18, Mary was found with child of the Holy Spirit. His, his fleshly, see, divine life was manifested in the flesh in Jesus. Divine life was manifested in the flesh in Jesus and the Spirit did it. See, so God's setting, setting the stage here. It says he was the second Adam and the firstborn from the dead. See, he set the stage. The Spirit gave Christ life. And to see, there was no human in invention, intervention in this. He was, he, was a, he was a walking miracle, you know. Jesus, the people said, show us a miracle that we may believe. Well, he was born of a virgin. It was the, the Spirit, the Spirit gave him life. And then also in his resurrection. 1 Peter 3.18, he was put to death in the flesh. But he was made alive by the Spirit. Yeah. See, the Spirit, the Spirit gave him life in the flesh, divine life in the flesh, and the Spirit raised the life. And see, so we are born, we are born with, 
in, in Christ is the same thing. It's the same thing in us. But I can't just say it any other way than just the way it is. Christ, as Christ, the Spirit gave Christ life in the body, He raised Christ's life again from the dead. That's what the Spirit does in the church. It is the Spirit that gives life. So Jesus set the, set the stage for this, uh, for salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The Lord contrasts the administration of the law at Mount Sinai through Moses and the administration of the Spirit through Christ in the New Covenant. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, Who also hath made us able ministers in the New Testament, not of the, lauder, of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills. That in, we might insert in there, in order that the Spirit might give life. See, the seed that is, that is sown in the earth must first die. And then it brings forth fruit. So we must be buried with Him. In baptism, then, then the, the Spirit gives life. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, you read back about the ministry, the, David talked about it in the, in the Psalms, read back about it in the, in the Exodus. This ministration of the law was glorious. Even Moses was, fear, was fearful at this. And his, his face uh, glowed at the ministration of this. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face, face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. See, so this ministration of the Spirit, the ministration of the Spirit is giving life. That's, the, that's how the Spirit ministers. See, the world, there, there's people in the world that say the Spirit does a lot of things. And it'd be, it'd be kind of worthless to recount all of them. But the Spirit, they say the Spirit does this and the Spirit does that. But the, the ministration of the Spirit is what the Scripture says. Not a ministration of the Spirit. Not one of the ministrations of the Spirit. The ministration of the Spirit is rather glorious and that's giving life. If you sum it all up, the Spirit gives life. He guides into all truth. He brings to remembrance. He comforts, but it's giving life. That's what, if you wrap it all up, that's what it is. It's giving, giving life, being born, born of the Spirit. And uh, back to our text, John 3, uh, verse 6, Jesus said, That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. See, that God, God's Spirit brings God's life. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Other places... In, in the scripture, it says, talking about this new man in Ephesians, it says that after the image of him that created him, that's what we've been given by, this, by the Spirit. It's that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, and that which is born of God does not sin, for his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin, for he is born of God. That which is born of Spirit is Spirit. See, the Spirit doesn't, it doesn't give you, he doesn't give you anything less than the life of God. Nothing less than God's life himself. And uh, God himself is never depleted by this. God's not, God's not any less. He's even more in salvation. He's not any less. <clears throat> it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. All of your assets are in the spirit of God. All of our assets. All of our, our advantages. All of our strengths. Are in, are in the Spirit. It is the Spirit that gives life. You won't, nobody will find graces outside of the Spirit. Nobody will find mercies outside of the Spirit. Nobody finds the love of God outside of the Spirit. Nobody finds strength outside of the Spirit. Nobody finds faith outside of the Spirit. It is the Spirit that gives life. Now the flesh profits nothing. So all of your liabilities are in the flesh. None of your liabilities are in the Spirit. We are not debtors to the flesh that we should obey its lusts. We need, people need to hear this. You're not debtors to the flesh. I need to hear this. Ye are not debtors to the flesh to obey its lusts. Ye are not. All of our liabilities are in the flesh. That's why it says 
Throw off every weight that besets us. Put off the old man. Mortify the deeds of the body. Put it off. The flesh profits nothing. Really, we just need to say it like it says. The flesh doesn't profit anything. Nothing. Flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. This Romans chapter 8 verse 10 has of late in, intrigued me and I'm not satisfied with my understanding of it. It says, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. I rejoice in that. Because my body needs to be dead. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. If Christ be in you, like I said, I, I want to see more of this than I see right now. But the Spirit is life. The way I understand it is the Spirit is your life. If, the, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, and that the Spirit is your life because of righteousness. The Spirit gives you life because of righteousness. It is the Spirit who gives life. Again, in Galatians chapter 4, the Lord talks about the two mounts. Which this is an allegory, being two covenants, he says. In Galatians chapter 4, I'll start reading at verse 25. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate has many more children than that she which has an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Verse 29. But as it was then, but as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. And so it is now. <laughs> so it is now. See, the children of promise are the children of persecution. If you have the promises now, you have persecution now. But when you'll have the pro when you receive the promises, that's when you have your new body and your new name and you shed the flesh. We should all be changed. We should be like him as he is. So this is a pretty good exchange program Amen. that the Lord has given us. If ye suffer with him, ye shall also reign with him. Amen. And I consider the sufferings in this present body are not worthy. Don't try to compare these things. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And this momentary light affliction, it is momentary. Light affliction is working for us an eternal weight of glory. Amen. This is a pretty good exchange program. I'd rather be a, a child of persecution now than, than to be where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Amen. See, the Lazarus... or. Uh, the rich man Lazarus, uh, Father Abraham said, you had your good things in the world, and now you're in torment. But to Lazarus, he said, Lazarus had torment in the world, now he's comforted. See, we can be tormented, and we can have discomforts for but a season, and then we're comforted forever in the Spirit. It is the Spirit who gives life. If ye are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. <laughs> for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. <clears throat> for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward mankind appeared... Not by works of righteousness which we had done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The renewing of the Holy Spirit. And I remember one of the prophets, he says, the Spirit of the Lord picked me up and took me to a valley. And he set me down in the midst of it and he said, this valley was full of bones. It was a valley full of death. It was full of bones. And it says these bones were dry. They were very dry. There was no sign. And they were even scattered. They weren't skeletons. They were scattered bones. And so this, see, death, death really does demolish. 
It, it, it killed them, they were dry, and they were even scattered. Because when the life came, the bones had to be put back together later. So this is the renewing of the Holy Spirit. He says, he says preach unto the bones. O valley of, of bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's what he said. This is, this, is how you, this is how a minister imparts life to the people. He says, hear the word of the Lord. He doesn't say, this do and live. He says, hear the word of the Lord. And breath entered them, Spirit says, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. That's what they were when they came to life. They were an army. The Spirit gives life. See, you come up ready for battle. You, you, do, not, you do not come up in leisure. When the Spirit gives life, you do not, you do not come up, as it were, in, in, the, in the lawn chair with lemonade. It's not, it's, the Spirit does not give birth to, to a, a relaxed, lackadaisical, if, that's, if I pronounce that right, kind, kind of people. The Spirit gives life, and the, peop, the people that come up, out of sin and death and, the, and the, the pit of destruction, they come up ready to fight. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. See, the new birth is our introduction into the kingdom of God. And as newborn, is like being newborn babes, Peter says. As newborn babes. And as Jesus said several times, becoming like little children. So this is our this is our introduction. But being, we're in the we're still in the body. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're still in a vile body. We're still in the enemy ground. This is what makes salvation so great. Part of it. Part of it. You're saved in a vile body in a condemned world. That's where God's working salvation. And so as soon as you're born in the spirit, you're in a jeopardous situation. Because you have, a, you, have a, you have to beat your body daily and make it your slave. It does not volunteer. You're, jeopardous, you're in jeopardous surroundings. So when this, the Spirit gives life, but now, see, the issue becomes staying alive. Amen. Staying alive. The Galatians, it does say that the Christ has become of no profit to them and that they were fallen from grace. So when the Spirit gives life, then the Spirit also sustains life. And this is, this, this is the progression of the new birth. The Spirit gives the life, makes them become as little children, as newborn babes, brings them up, and now you've got to stay alive. Amen. <clears throat> new life is, is tender, and it's susceptible. As many of you know, we've... My wife and I have just had a, had a child, and Judah does not play out in the yard. <laughs> his, his life is sensitive, and he's tender. So are the children of God. When they are born again, they come up in full armor, because this life, this life is sensitive, and the Lord protects it and cares for it. <clears throat> and so the Spirit, equipped with life, he, he equips us for the, for the good fight of faith. Because as soon as you, see, when you, when you wish to do good, I find that evil is present with me. For the, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, so that I cannot do that which I want. So those who, who have this uh, life by the spirit are warriors in the kingdom of God. Galatians 5.16, a commission with a promise which is precious to those who walk by faith. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yes. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. Flesh cannot survive where the Spirit is. Amen. You walk in the Spirit, and you won't hear your flesh. And quite frankly, the flesh can't speak very loud when you're in the Spirit. When you're, in, when you're in the Spirit, the, the sin, sin in the world is not appealing. Amen. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. It's not appealing anymore. And so these, these texts now, they're, 
I'm trying, trying to show that the, the Spirit is sustaining the life that the Spirit gives. Romans 8, verse 13, If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body. That's a strong word, mortify. He doesn't, he doesn't say just like put an ace bandage. <laughs> it doesn't say like put an ace bandage around the flesh. Mortify the deeds of the body. Ye shall live. <clears throat> if the flesh lives, you will die. And if you live, the flesh will die. Amen. Romans 8 verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The walking in the Spirit protects and annexes you from condemnation. Amen. See, the, con condemn the wrath of God is sure. For which reason, the Spirit says, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. The wrath of God is coming. Walking in the Spirit excludes you from condemnation. <clears throat> so if we keep ourselves in the Spirit, the Spirit will keep us unto everlasting life. Romans 6, verse 8, He that sows unto the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now again, this is, this is the Lord for you. You get more than what you put in. See, see one, one little boy when Jesus was in the world, he gave his lunch. One lunch. And they fed the whole multitude. It's because Jesus was there. So you sow unto the Spirit, and you shall reap of the Spirit. Life everlasting. I thinking of the, some of the things that we, that we sow to the Spirit. We sow time. You give yourself unto the Lord holy. Put, yourself to the, put your hands under the plow and not look back. You sow, sow your time. Sow affection. Loving the things of the Lord. Loving the things which are above. Not loving the things of the earth. You give all of your affection. He says, the, uh, David says, Unite my heart. Unite my heart to fear your name. You sow your affections unto the Lord. And you sow service, offer your body living sacrifice, which is your reasonable, uh, reasonable, reasonable service. You serve the Lord and you sacrifice, sacrifice unto the Lord. So these are the things that you offer. And the Lord takes those in the spirit and gives eternal life back to you. See, this is, this is our God for us. He's a God of abundance. Romans chapter 8 verses 15 and 16 says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God Amen. now I chose this in because part of the good fight of faith is realizing and remembering who we are who who the spirits made us to be who we are in Christ it's remembering because sin deceives you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin so we have to remember that you are the children of God. Now, your flesh will not bear witness that you are the children of God. Your mind will not bear witness that you are the children of God. The sons of Belial will not bear witness that you are the children of God. Your co-workers might not bear witness that you are the children of God. For some of us, your family members will not bear witness that you are the children of God. Your neighbors might not bear witness that ye are the children of God, but the Spirit of God, bearing witness with your spirit, that ye are the children of God, this gives power unto perseverance. It bears witness. And Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 says, uh, he, Paul prays that we might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, and here's why, in order that Christ may dwell in you, that's why. And that you can comprehend and know the love of Christ. That's why it's strengthened through the Spirit. So that Christ can dwell in you. You can know the love of Christ and be filled with all the fullness of God. This is what the Spirit does. Strengthens you so that you can be a divine vessel. And we're brought into it to know the love of God. Now there's, in, in closing, <clears throat> I noticed that on the schedule there wasn't, there's a few places in the Scripture here. Uh, of the earnest of the Spirit, or being sealed by His Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm going to preach a concluding message here on what wasn't on the, on the schedule. The earnest of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
verse 22. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Now, he which establishes us with you is Christ, in Christ, and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us, and given the whole, the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. He's, God's given a promise, and He sent His Son, and His Spirit seals. A seal is a preservation. A seal is a preservation. And given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought us for this selfsame thing is God, who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. If God gave us a seal, and if God gave us well, if God gave us a seal, this means that there's still danger. And if God gave us an earnest, that means that there's a lot more to come. There's a lot more to come. We have the first fruits. Just the, just the grapes of Eshkol is what we have. So a, a, an inheritance mean that there's, means that there's a lot, lot more to come. So the earnest of the Spirit has great keeping power for those who walk in the Spirit has great keeping power. To those that walk by faith, seeking a country of their own, make it clear that they're not, that they're not seeking a country here. Seeking a country of their own, the, the, the Spirit keeps by, by being a seal of this, of this life. Hope lives, under the, hope lives under the persuasion that he who promised is faithful. That's, that's when hope abounds is when you're persuaded that he who promised is faithful and will bring it to pass. So let all that name the name of the Lord abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit because it is the Spirit that gives life. Amen.